probably not every company owner would do it, but I bet there are more company owners and managers that would do it than people think. I bet there are a lot of employees who have an idea that if they took to their, you know, the owner of their company or their manager or whatever, I bet they would be open to it because I don't think people realize how many problems owners and managers are trying to solve at any given time. And one of those is how can I get more value for less money and and have more resources to use for these other things I have ideas about and all of this. One of the reasons that I love doing these podcasts is that I get a chance to speak to some great people who've started their own business. And Chris, who you're going to hear from a bit more, is no exception. What he just said there was perfect for people who are looking to start their own business, but want to start in a safe way, in a guaranteed way. And the best way to do that is to ask your current employer whether you can supply them. And that's what Chris did. And that's exactly how he got his business off the ground. So I know you're going to really enjoy Chris's story. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Chris. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the Share Your Story podcast. I'm really looking forward to hearing your story today. And just for our listeners, you're in Texas and I'm in the UK, so we're many miles apart. And through the magic of technology, we're having a chat and, and getting to know each other as well. So uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so my first question that I ask all my guests just to get us started is, would you share a little bit with us about your personal life? So that means where were you born? Um, did you move around? Um, you know, something about your education. You can share about your family, but you don't have to. Um, and um, if we get started with that, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. So over to you, Chris. All right. Sounds good. Well, I have always lived in Texas. Uh, I was born and raised here, and um, I was I was born in the north part of Texas, but we moved to the Houston area when I was you know, six or seven, something like that. And right, and I was always here. Um, it's it's a nice area to live in. I actually lived in a suburb uh, uh, north of Houston, and just grew up here. And I went to Texas A and M University for my undergrad and. It was it was local, and I had a actually went there because I had a, a really fantastic job opportunity uh, that gave me lots of extra time um, and paid well while I was there. And mm. and then uh, after that, I came back to Houston and uh, had a job at a, at a actually a small manufacturing company. And then while I was there, I started working on my MBA at the University of Houston uh, locally. And and uh, once I was done with that. I focused on operations because I'm always, I've always been a systems thinker and that's kind of where I was drawn. And, and, uh, why, were, I got why a, were you a systems I, thinker? Oh my gosh. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, <laughs> that would, that would probably answer a lot of other questions as well, but, but I've just always been, uh, very curious about, you know, why a process happens the way it happens and if we can make it you know, if, if I can align it with something else and mm. kind of make it a little, a little more productive, a little easier, flow a little better. Yeah. Um, and, and also there's a certain analytical component of, of operations. You know, I always, I always enjoyed the statistics component. Mm. I really like the, the inventory and supply chain parts where you just have a lot of moving stuff and trying to keep them flowing mm. in order and in a timely manner. So, um, but yeah, I, I from there I went to HP as a Hewlett Packard for about three years, and that's a that's a wonderful company. But after being there for a while, there was actually a day I was a I was a demand planner for. They gave me a way bigger job than I than they should have given a twenty five year old, and right, and I really enjoyed it. But I one day was I was at my desk and I had three screens open, all the spreadsheets, and I had spreadsheets laid out all across my desk and I just kind of went I hate this <laughs> you know <laughs> I can't 
<laughs> I can't do this job. My soul is, is leaving my body. And, oh, wow. But, but be clear, the company is wonderful. I enjoyed the people. I enjoyed the culture. I, you know, I, I enjoyed the facilities. Um, it just wasn't, it just wasn't the right fit for me. The mega company thing wasn't, wasn't the right place for me at the time. Right, right. And the old company, the small company, the manufacturing company where I used to work, they got wind of it and they asked me to come back. And so I, I did. And I just had more roles there and, and more responsibility and, and it was a lot of fun, but even, even being there and, and, you know, a little bit of the reason I went back is because you work directly with the owners, and I knew I would learn a lot about sure. uh, running a small business, which I've always wanted to do. Mm. And so after being many, there about three years, well, go ahead. How many employees did they have? At the time, I, I think they had something like 30 or 25 or something oh, like that. Oh, that's a now, great size, yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, they're they're a bit bigger now. You know, that was gosh, 12 or 15 years ago, mm. uh, they're 55-ish employees or, or so now, but uh, great, great company. You know, you really got to be close to the operations, and, and um, that's, that is actually where I found my, my strength as far as marketing goes. And what, uh, what's the name of the company? Are you allowed to say? Yeah, I am. It's a, it's a manufacturing company called American Pole and Timber, and right. they, they're I always sum them up as saying they're kind of like a machine shop for big timber products. You know, they make timber trusses and, and timber products for industrial projects, and wow. they do a lot of marine and shoreline and fender systems and uh, for, for shipping ports. And yes. Really cool company. Really yeah. neat. They taught me a lot about niches. Right. Um, so really, really fun. So I was there for a while. Yeah. And um, really enjoyed it and, and found, you know, that what I was good at was was matching what a company is good at with the demand, which actually kind of came from my HP days. Right. And so with these guys, though, I could really apply it at the ground level where you could go, okay, we're really good at making these things. Now let's match up the marketing and what the sales guys are doing with those things. And, you know, let's promote those because they're the highest margins. We can do them the fastest and the best and nobody else is doing it and all of these things. Yeah. So uh, that was... That was fun. It was fun to find something that I that I really excelled at. Great. And what yeah. what what when you when you say in terms of getting the demand, well, what specifically did you have to do in order to get demand increased? So, for them, they have uh, a culture of saying yes. It's one of the things I love about that company. You know, where they do the thing, uh, someone will call and say, man, I really need someone to make this thing and I can't find anybody. Mm. And their salespeople will just go, yeah, we'll make that. And they'll go, let me get your price. And they'll get off the phone and they'll go, man, I just told this guy we would make this thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do we do? You mm -hmm. know, let's figure this out. Mm. And, and that's how they, and the thing is, like I said, they're sort of like a machine shop for timber products. They actually can make anything. Yeah, sure. The guy on the phone may not know how to do it right then, but they can do it. And, mm. and so by doing that, they open themselves up to just tons of opportunities to find new products that they're very good at making. And, you know, and, and by, by being good at making, they're always going to make a quality product, but, but some they can make faster and better and more productively and more profitably and, and all that than other products. And, and when you find those, then they would say, hey, Chris, find out how many of these the market wants. Right. And so then we find out what the demand was for that thing and then go, okay, let's test it. You know, let's see if we can sell more of these. And when we would, when we would get some traction, then that would become another part of the company. I mean, there were, I can think of several products like that where they had never sold it before. They had never heard of it before. And now it's a, you know, multi-million dollar product line. So it's, it's a lot of fun to me, to kind of take something out of thin air and turn it into something that's, you know, really growing at people and generating jobs. and But it's and, also uh, counterintuitive, though, Chris, isn't it? Because I've worked for manufacturing companies before, textile companies, for a long time, like decades. And and um, when we when we were working there, I was, you know, I was in the sales department, you know, promoting yeah. products. But 
there was a limited range, you know, and we could not get outside of that range because the manufacturing team just couldn't cope with the variety. And right. And, you know, so many different processes, you know, because different fabrics have all sorts of different processes. And, I mean, okay, maybe you're saying, yeah, well, timber, you can just dice and slice it whatever way you want to, but it still means you're increasing the product line to such an extent that it could be almost unmanageable. <laughs> yeah, that's that can be an issue, hmm. but there – and this is possible with just about any sort of production company or service company. It's just that the breadth to which they can do it might be different, right? So some can do it with almost anything, and some can do it with a more limited scope. I can imagine in textiles it's a much more limited scope of mm. kind of how far outside the, the edges they can go. Yeah. But with these guys, they can make just about anything out of wood. It, it's, a, it's a unique company, certainly, and uh, impressive, at least. Yeah. And and so with them, they really could just say yes. And then they were – the company was owned by two uh, brothers-in-law. And uh, one was more of the finance and, you know, just kind of management side. The other one was the operational side. And it helped that uh, they both loved new ideas and getting into new things. But the operations-focused uh, partner, he – he kind of loved biting into stuff like that. So when there was a new product line, he would go, man, what new machines can we get? And what can uh, we put out there? And, you know, I mean, that's it, amazing. It, all of these things came together. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's like so many companies, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not just one thing. It's, it's a little bit of culture and it's a little bit of this guy being good at that. And this, this woman being good at this. And mm. uh, it all kind of lines up and, and you end up growing something very interesting. Very, very fascinating. Yeah. And the thing yeah. is, by by having the yes culture, it means right. that you can have, you will discover products that you hadn't thought of because a client wants this particular product and then turning on its head and going, okay, Chris, go and find out what demand we there is for this and then let's put it into a major product line. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I recommend it to a lot of companies now. Just, you know, be a little more willing to say yes. Even if you have to kind of say yes, but, you know, and that yes, but might mean, yes, we can do that, but it'll cost you. Or yes, we can do That's that, right. but it'll take a month instead of six days. You know, that yes. sort of thing. Yes. Um, just be open to, to ideas. Don't just say, no, we don't do that quick, mm. which is what a lot of people do. Fascinating. So. Okay. All right. So you were them, them doing all this demand management stuff. Mm hmm and then what happened there? So I had always wanted to start a company. And um, I... Why? It, you know, I got... Well, well I don't know why. <laughs> it was a bug. <laughs> Not, and neither of my parents are entrepreneurs. They don't really have any... Well, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. But, right. but that was... Uh, actually, in, in fact, coincidentally, he owned a sawmill. And he knew everything there was to know about timber and lumber and, and all of that. So I always thought it was kind of ironic that I ended up in the, in the sort of timber industry. Yeah. But I, I always wanted a company, and I didn't know what, but I did find out that I was pretty good at this, you know, matching marketing with, with what a company is good at, you know, demand mm. and, and supply. And so I kind of on the side just started, you know, because when people hear you're in marketing, especially, oh, I don't know, let's call this 2005 or seven or whatever, mm. people just kind of start saying, hey, I have a company, what should we do? And and so I started doing a little sort of consulting. And right. then uh, I eventually came with the idea of, of Lead Optimize, this, this marketing company that optimized marketing systems for lead generation to kind of keep salespeople busy and, and uh but, you know, really it was about matching that, what a company's good at with, with the market. Mm -hmm. And so, so I actually went to the owners of American Pull and Timber and I said, hey guys, I've got a good proposition for you. And, you know, the summary was, I'll do what I'm doing for you now, but for half as much and I won't be in the office and I can do it for other people too. And they said, sounds like a good deal. And, um, wow. I mean, they were happy to pay half as much and get the same stuff. Right. So mm. I, uh, <laughs> so I, I was lucky in that I got to, you know, continue to pay my mortgage and start a company and, and that sort of thing. And uh, so that's how, that's how 
lead optimize started. That's how the first. And and first I'd like to interject there because you know this podcast is going out to people who could be dreaming of starting their own business, but they have no idea how to get started. And that's why we hear these stories of guys like you and other people. What is so beautiful in what you shared was that the company you worked for became your first client almost. And yeah. you did you did a deal with them whilst you were still with them. Mm -hmm. And that is such a great way of starting your own business. It is the best way, I believe, of starting your own business. I, I'd have to agree with you. Yeah, it, it takes, it might take, probably not every company owner would do it, but I no. bet there are more company owners and managers that would do it than people think. Mm. I bet there are a lot of employees who have an idea that if they took to their, you know, the owner of their company or their manager or whatever, I bet bet they would be open to it because I don't think people realize how many problems owners and managers are trying to solve at any given time. Yes. And one of those is how can I get more value for less money and, and have more resources to use for these other things I have ideas about and all of this. Yeah. And if you can help them solve that problem in any way, there's a good chance they're open to it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, it's just something that I've I've said to friends before, you know, hey, if you have an idea, just consider taking it to them. I bet, yeah. I bet they're open, as long as it aligns with the company, obviously. So that is great. Okay, yeah. so what happened then? <laughs> How did you get other clients? Uh, you know, then it's just the classic thing of start hitting the pavement, and you know, I did everything. I tried cold calling, mm -hmm. um, which I hated. Mm -hmm. uh, we and all I, do. I, yeah. Yeah. I drummed up a few things, but actually what ended up making the difference for me is I've always been quite good at um, what I call consultative selling. So, you know, not hard sales or whatever, just helping people solve a problem yes. and then they'll use you to solve it. And, and what made the difference for me is that I joined a chamber of commerce and I just went and got involved and then I met... Uh, I don't know, my second or third client there and, I mean, who became my second or third client. And he said, hey, come to this breakfast group I'm in. And so I went to this breakfast group and it was a great, uh, what's, what we call a category exclusive group, you know, where there's no competitors in the group. Yes. There's only one person from every business. Got it. Yeah. And then they met every week and you really get to know people and they really get to know you. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that group, I got a couple of clients from there and then Someone invited me to another one of those groups, and they invited me to another group. And so I just kind of got to know these various breakfast groups, and yes. that that helped a lot. And, of course, some traditional marketing, you know, the, just pay-per-click and stuff through our website and, sure. and all of that. Um, but I would say what really made a difference for me in that beginning, which every everyone who starts a business understands it when they're bootstrapping, is you typically have more time than money. And so you got to, right. you got to go spend that time properly. Mm, mm. So that's what, that's what got me going. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's still an ongoing business for you. It is. Yeah, it is. It's still, it's still small. Um, mm -hmm. Largely because a couple of years ago I started spending, oh, I don't know, anywhere from 25% to half my time on attention to detail and just because I enjoy it so much. And so I have a small team here uh, of three people who largely take care of operations. And for Lead Optimize, I can primarily do just sort of management things and sure. uh, consulting components. So, gotcha. but I, you know, I haven't, for instance, I haven't designed a website for years. No, um, no. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice little company and we're getting into new things and, the amount of time I spend in Lead Optimize is really dependent upon, you know, if we have a new client or if we have, uh, like, for instance, we just came, became an agency partner for a marketing automation system. And so I'm certainly more involved in that because I need that to go properly mm. and, and to be integrated properly. And um, so, you know, that, that takes more time. Sure. Got it. Okay. All right. So... What made you to move on to the next project then? I'm really curious because <laughs> you, you have Lead Optimize. That's going well. You've got a group of people helping you, supporting you, growing that. 
Mm-hmm. So what what changed? What I mean, because you've been doing that for quite a while. So how many years has Lead Optimize been going? It started in 2008. Right. So we're we're uh, pushing 11 years. And in fact, May, of course, my first company, so I remember the, the main date, but uh, May 16th will be, of this year, will be 11 years Great. In, in business. So, which is a nice place to be. It was finally, it was nice to hit the 10-year mark because if you look at the percentage of companies that make it to 10 years, it's really small. Very small, and yeah. So, uh, it's it's pretty nice. So, but let's see, attention to detail started Unintentionally, uh, in in something like 2010 or 11, I had an employee at Lead Optimize who uh, was very talented and and sharp, but his attention to detail was abysmal. I, and I, I just he could make anything, but he couldn't make it ready for a client. He couldn't make it in a way that it could be passed off to the next person in the chain, whoever that was. Uh, in a usable format, and because it needed to be revised two or three times, I mean, just off the charts. But but he was so talented, and I wanted to keep him. And so I started looking for training or you know something, a book, whatever to to give to him or put him through or something. Mm. And I couldn't find anything. And right. um, I I thought, well, I'll make my own thing because you know we're entrepreneurs and we think we can do anything. <laughs> and so. I, you know, but I was just going to make like a worksheet or something that, you know, would take a couple of hours and we would sit down and chat. And then I, I, I realized two things. One is that it's a way bigger topic than I thought it was. I mean, just, just way bigger. And then two is that I really enjoyed it. I, for whatever reason, I just thought it was the most interesting content I had, I had kind of bitten off. And so that sent me down a rabbit hole of this research and, I mean, to the point that my wife was like, what is this weird distraction you have with this, you know, attention to detail issue? And um, so that's it. I didn't get to keep that employee, unfortunately, because I, did, I didn't figure the thing out for five years. You know, I just was doing tons of research. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but that's that's how that started. I mean, I did nothing with it for... Oh gosh! Uh, until 2017, I didn't do anything commercial with that. So for right. for six or seven years, I I I just was a researcher on the side. Six or and, seven uh, years. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> that's a long time. Well, well, here's the thing. Yes, yeah. the topic is attention to detail, right? So you can't. Okay, yeah, have, <laughs> of course. You know, <laughs> I get it, Chris. I get it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, I can't come out with something that's not really complete and oh. and uh and frankly it was just an interest i mean it it took three years for me to even realize that wow this is something people want and i i realized it because i i put up a website um and i was just posting stuff i learned it wasn't a blog it was just a website it was yeah. like an html and and people would call me i wasn't offering anything people mm-hmm. would call and say hey can you come to a workshop or can you train our trainers to do this and that sort of thing? And I would say, no, no, no. I'm, you know, I just thought this was interesting. <laughs> I'm just researching. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And after a while, it it finally occurred to me, you know, okay, I'm really putting something together here. And I, you know, I think I can, I can actually package this and I enjoy it. And, and uh, in 2000, early 2017, I got a call and someone, somewhere in there, I had, I had actually bought, the domain name attention to detail from from the person who owned it, right? And I started putting stuff on that, and and I wasn't really strongly saying, you know, hey, you can do workshops or whatever. I just kind of said available for discussions and consultation and mm. that sort of thing. And and so someone reached out and said, hey, will you come do a workshop for our for a team of ours? It was a compliance team and at a software company. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I can do that. I didn't have a product together yet. You know, I, I didn't have a workshop developed, but I had a system. You know, you, know, I, you I, learned you learned to say yes from your timber company, didn't you? <laughs> pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yep. I used, so I, you used the yes I, word. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I didn't really have the product, you know. Mm. Um, but I had, I had the system. I had the framework. And so right. I put together a, uh, a really nice 
presentation in PowerPoint and made really nice materials and, you know, workbooks and exercise books and went and gave it and it was received well. And that basically gave me the confidence to do it, do it some more. So, mm. and I, 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 I enjoy the workshops so much and I, I do my best to, uh, you know, make sure that the groups get as much out of it as, as possible. Did you, just out of interest, did you sure. run any workshops when you, when you were um, full on in lead optimize? Did you do training there? We have done some. I've, right. I've done a couple of like full day workshops where right. people come to the office and and uh, do some training, and then I've done a little bit of speaking. You know, where I'll go to a chamber of commerce or yes. and even a few paid speaking things. You know, where there's a company that said, "Hey, we're getting all of our managers together, and we need, we want someone to come and kind of explain these I've got it. aspects." Yeah. So it wasn't so, a new skill you had to learn as well. You, you no, kind of knew really. how to do deliver a workshop and right, right. Yeah. And I, I really enjoy. I'm actually, I don't know if shy is the right word, but but I'm not I'm not an extrovert by any means. But for whatever reason, I really enjoy speaking. Yeah, and um, I'm happy in front of a crowd of people and and training and sort of helping and solving problems and and so it's a it's a pretty natural fit as far as what I enjoy doing and my comfort zones and and all of that. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, so you did your first workshop and, and you went, yeah, I love doing this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happened next? <laughs> so let's see. Well, then I had the content. So then I went ahead and officially on the website, I said, you know, okay, we do workshops, but I wasn't, I wasn't putting money into, I wasn't advertising or anything like that. And um, then I, well, then I went ahead and did an online course because I had the workshop, I had the material, so I basically just put that into an online format. Right. It's a smaller version, not it's not as big as the live workshop, largely because the live workshop includes a lot of exercises. Sure, and that's a little harder to do in a in an online course. But but uh, to my surprise, a lot of people started getting the online course, and yeah. um, I mean a, a lot, a handful, you know, enough to make this really worthwhile and be encouraging. And, um, yeah, from there, I, I just started doing it. And, and in 2018, I did several more workshops. Um, right. Again, really putting money into, into marketing. And, and this year is actually the first time that I've started really trying to get out there a little more. Yes. Um, 2018 was about trying things and making sure I had the message down and tweaking and adjusting and improving and, uh, 2019. There's always improvements. Again, the topic is attention to detail, but mm. I, um, I'm getting out there more with it. Got with it, it now. Yeah. Okay, so, so it started with that employee. Mm -hmm. You then was definitely a case of build it and they will come. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And and you're now seeing people. There's an appetite for this topic where people. And you know, what is, it is so appropriate for this, I'll just share how I feel about it and whether I'm right or wrong, anyway, you can tell me, but it's so right for this current age because mm -hmm. there are millions of distractions at the moment right. and people are distracted all over the place. I, I really don't know how people get any work done in offices anymore, <laughs> you know, l let alone the distractions from going to meetings, interruptions. Now you've got all the technology interruptions. Even if people aren't al allowed to go onto social media, there are internal messaging systems on top of email as well. There are workflows, there are, you know, other things that, that people are engaging with online where things are pinging up all over the place. How do people even, you know, manage to get 20 minutes of attention, focused attention right. on something? It's a really right. tough problem, I believe, at the moment. And that's why a lot of organizations are putting in, you know, mindfulness programs mm -hmm. because, you know, whether people like it or not, they want it helps people concentrate a bit better. So yeah. 
what what is the real deal with this what so you've discovered this what are what are you training people to do differently sure so it, it's it's based largely around sort of in first of all people need to understand attention to detail there's there are three types of attention to detail and because i think people sort of use the word or the phrase obscurely they'll just say you know you need to pay more attention to detail or mm-hmm. you need to be more detail oriented and they're not they're not very specific about it which is sort of a a basic management thing you know when you're giving feedback you should be more specific about what it is you mean and um but there are three types of attention to detail there's contrastive uh additive well analytical and additive and contrastive is the right or wrong part of things you know it's either there's only one solution for contrastive attention to detail it's it's yes or it's no it's there or it's not it matches or it doesn't it's red or it's blue mm-hmm. um, and that's very systemizable so you know you can you can create systems around it that will that will for the most part automate that level of attention to detail that's Contrastive attention to detail is why can you say uh, McDonald's that w- can run with 16-year-olds. Sorry, you know? Chris. Could you, could, no, you okay. s- could you say that word a bit slower? Because I've never heard of it. Con- uh, contrastive? Contra- con- how do yep. you spell it? Uh, C-O-N-T-R-A-S-T-I-V-E. Yeah. Contrastive. Con- like contrast. Ah, uh, contra- const. Say it again. Contrastive. Okay. Contrastive. I'm not even yeah. going to try and say it. I mean, I'm a Dutchman, so it's even <laughs> right. worse for me sometimes. Okay. <laughs> but okay, so it's a contrast, contrast, contrastive. Yep. Wow, it's really yep. difficult it's, to say for me. Um, <laughs> and it's just this versus that, you know. It's and that's the deal you. about it. That's the yeah. big part is that there's there's only one solution, and because of that, it's very systemizable and you can remove the need for specialized knowledge. Yeah. You, know, you, you can, can you can give someone it. a checklist or yeah. a worksheet or whatever and you know, you can pull anyone off the street and say, look at that and here's the checklist. It's mm-hmm. either yes or no or it's there or it's not or it's one or two or it matches it or it doesn't. Got it. And, and then you have analytical attention to detail. And this is where most knowledge workers operate. This is where most people operate during the day, especially in an office setting. Uh, and it's you have more than one solution. Um, you know, this is what's the best strategy to, you know, move forward with this project. How, you know, what um, someone in a lab may say, what five chemicals or which of these five chemicals are the best in what combination will give us the best formulation. And so there's some specialized knowledge needed. But it can still be systematized in that it's been done before. There are things we can look up. You know, there, there are formulas that, that apply here. So we can apply some systems that exist. But someone with some knowledge has to know what we apply to those. Mm-hmm. And so what do we bring in? You know, do we need someone who knows more stuff? Is there a system we can apply? Is there, I mean, it could be that a calculator, just having the right calculator takes care of this for us. Um, but, but there are ways to, to sort of automate that. Yes. And then additive attention to detail is about creating something new. It's about, it's about innovation. And the process can be systematized, but not really the innovation itself, because it's new. It's never been done before. It's, it's, that part is complex. But yes. we can systematize the process by which we find what we need to innovate around. Got it. You know, so if a company wants to create a new product, they don't want to just make something that isn't meaningful, right? So right. they want to make sure they analyze everything possible and look at, you know, competitors and what's already on the market and mm. what they're doing now, what they're good at, not good at, what exists and mm-hmm. what's what's real and you know, what's just science fiction and and by by doing that, by really drilling down into the details of every component of that they can find what they need to innovate around. And and this is something that people who focus on innovation, this is what they do in their workshops, right? They help companies drill down to this level. Um, Steve Jobs was, you know, he's the one people just think of as the 
super detail oriented you know changing the world type type leader yes so but that's that's a big part that we start with is is getting that that foundation of understanding that there are three types of attention to detail yeah and just understanding those creates creates a nice a nice foundation for the framework and then there are five fundamental elements of attention to detail and we we delve into those that's the that's the part of the workshop that takes you know that's two hours two oh. hours alone right um and that's where you get into topics like you said earlier. You, you know, you you get into distractions. You get into um, mindfulness. Actually, it, that certainly comes up. I'm a big believer in mindfulness. Yes. And uh, I didn't I didn't know of thing. I mean, I, I was aware of it, but I was not a person who would have tried mindfulness or meditation before this research. But uh, through the research, I found that you know this is something I have to address and. Mm. And uh, it actually, I would say it's a game changer for me. It, would, it changed my life. I, you know, practice mindfulness and, and uh, meditate more than I certainly would have told you I would have. If you asked me when I was even 30 years old, you know, do you think you'll end up being a person who meditates? I would have said pretty sure the answer is no. Yeah, got it. But uh, enjoy it. Mm. So. And it's, oh, it's it's really interesting because... You know, at the end of the day, what mindfulness helps us do is to focus on the moment because you're focusing on your breath in the main. Okay, there are, all, there are all sorts of different types of meditations out there. You know, people could be chanting, transcendental meditation, all sorts of different ways. But if we just talk about, you know, mindfulness, the basic kind of level, is you're, you're focusing on your breath and that's it. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, fine, your mind will wander and all you have to do is go back and focus on your breath when you when you catch yourself. And right. you, you just keep doing and doing that for however long you want, even if people do it for, I don't know, 20 seconds, you know, just right. do it for 20 seconds. If you want right. to do it for 20 minutes, do it for 20 minutes, an hour, whatever. So... um. What that does, I believe, is because you're focusing on the ne the kind of that moment, the here and now. It mm -hmm. trains the brain when you're then working on tasks um, to focus your attention on the here and now, rather than because the mind wanders after a while. And I mean, in your research, did you come across this thing that I have people? I've heard people mention before is that we can only do meaningful work for like short amounts of time. So like 20 minutes, perhaps, yes. I think was a figure that I've heard before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the that kind of time that people put on it is it, it varies. I mean, I've heard mm. I've heard it in different ways. I've heard time and then also there's a factor of how many things you have on your mind at that you know, at, at one time. Mm. And then of course there's things like how challenging it is and if you're in flow and all of this, all of this sort of thing. But so to, so to your point about how mindfulness helps you maintain your focus, it's, it is the practice of focusing, but by the, on the very same token, it, it's the practice of ignoring distractions. Yeah. So that's, you know, so in terms of all the distractions, that's what you're doing. You're you're practicing ignoring those distractions, and and again, on the same token, that is what enables you to focus. Is that you can you know uh, let go of those distractions, and and I I think you hit on why so many people might try meditation or mindfulness is, but quit quickly is because they do that thing where they they start, but then they find their mind wandering. And then yes. they they kind of come back and they find themselves one their mind wandering and and they just get frustrated by it. But that's kind of the point. The, yeah. the point is to start the session, and you your mind will wonder. I mm. mean, if you've been doing it for a long time, maybe it starts wondering at eighteen minutes instead mm. of seven seconds. But it will it will wonder. You will get to the point where you suddenly realize you're thinking about that kid you knew in third grade. Mm. And not about your breath, you know, mm, mm. and 
you know, we have no idea how we come around to these, to, to whatever it is we're thinking about, you know, the kids' soccer practice or whatever. But, but that's the point, is to uh, just be able to bring yourself back around. And what, what is the, you know, ser- with the work that you're doing and been doing, and I appreciate it's a, mm-hmm. it's a shortish journey so far, and it's only just starting to yeah. take off for you. And right. I appreciate you sharing the journey where, where you're at right now. But how is how can this this work that you're doing? How can this benefit organisations? What where is the because everybody wants to go? Okay, is this just another you know another consultant who's trying to sell us some other thing that we right. we think we we don't really know if we need uh, sure. because it could be a hard sell, right? To say. <laughs> You need to improve your attention to detail. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the, I, I can tell you from a few different angles. Well, one is that the people who contact me are either an individual and they want, uh, they want the online course or a lot of them want one-on-one coaching, which I don't do at this point. Mm. Um, but they want the online training because they got a review from management that says, you know, you need to be more detail oriented right. or maybe they're just frustrated because they want to do better. That, that actually uh, is quite a few people. Mm-hmm. And um, for them, the feedback is everything from thanks so much. I'm able to focus better and, you know, making fewer mistakes to, mm-hmm. Hey, I got to keep my job. And that's really rewarding. You know, I, I love those, those stories of, you know, after the training, I'm doing much better. My manager, you know, said I can keep my job. Um, and then you have the, you have talent development professionals who, you know, want training for teams within an organization. And that usually comes because it was requested, uh, typically from upper management or from maybe a director who said, uh, we had a mistake and it was pretty straightforward that it was because of lack of attention to detail. And so we would like to emphasize the importance of this to everyone and make meaningful adjustments to the team and to the, to the culture of the, right. of the group. Got it. And so that's the focus for a team is when I do the workshop with a team, um, and usually there's, I mean, I've had ones as small as six and I've had as large as 35. Mm. And and we can do smaller if anyone wants, and we can do larger, you know. But the the value they get out of it is, of course, just the training itself. So at the individual level, the individual has a framework that they can use to apply uh, systems or methods that they can improve attention to detail in the work they do every day. And as a group, it gives a common language and yes. a mutual respect for this for this thing we're all trying to do, which is be a little more uh, detail-oriented on a mm. daily basis, mm. everyday excellence, basically. And so, you know, you want to, you want there to be this respect of. Uh, well, let's use distractions as a as as an example. You know, if there's a water cooler conversation, it's okay for someone to say, "Hey, guys, I'm trying to work here. Can you, you know, can you take that down the hall?" Yeah, sure. Or, if someone's tapping, you know, clicking their pen or playing their music too loudly, it's okay to put headphones on or um, just say, hey, you know, please stop the distractions or to go work in the conference room for a little while. So there's this, there's this sort of common language and common understanding that's, that's mm-hmm. developed mm-hmm. within teams, and that's a big part of the value uh, on, top of, on top of the core curriculum. Fascinating. Yeah, and, and is this – are you – targeting specific organizations or companies? I mean, are these, you know, people that are perhaps typically in, in technology companies or is it literally anybody who's looking to improve? You know, you know I haven't pinpointed that yet, mm. but the, the organizations that tend to reach out are, it's, it's an office setting typically, um, and they are, I've had quite a few people from, software companies or service oriented companies. Yeah. And it could be sales, it could be the compliance department. That's kind of a big one. I hear from compliance folks right. a lot because risk risk is their business basically. Um and then 
I've talked to quite a few people from engineering organizations, right? Uh, which just personally fascinates me. Um, I, mm. Just really interesting organizations. But of course, I talked to a lot of human resources, but that's because you know, someone in a larger company will go to human resources and say, hey, can you find a trainer for this topic? Um, and then finance and accounting is is the other one, which is almost a cliche for attention yes. to detail yes. sort of <laughs> components and issues, right? So Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I haven't done it so long. I mean, I look forward to the future where I can go, you know, every most people are from this, 37% are from this, and, right. you know, 8% are from this, and 27 are from this. Right. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not there yet. I, I love it. It's brilliant. I, I think it's badly needed um, in, in today's age where everybody is so, so distracted. And nowadays, you know, people are walking down the street and traveling and commuting and all they're doing is looking at their smartphone and yeah. they're, they're just missing the world by right. just looking down. And yeah. it's very, very sad to see and witness. But that 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 distraction people are taking into the workplace as well. And therefore, yeah. they've, in effect, they have trained their brain to be distracted. So mm -hmm. they've they've opened their brain open. They've opened their brain to say, yeah, distract me. And, <laughs> you know, technology and I love what Steve Jobs has done for the world, but I bet he never would have. I mean, he was a meditator <laughs> after all, you know, and and he would never have realized that this would have, you know, or perhaps would never have expected that this would have been misused in the way that it's being misused today. Right. Um, and even Apple realized only in their release last year to say, okay, we're going to give you the technology so you can self-monitor, you know, the amount of time, yeah. screen time that you're giving yourself, which is a great mm -hmm. thing, you know. But of course, they don't want us to stop using their devices, but... Right. I mean, we, we can go into a whole other discussion, <laughs> but we <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to do that. So, okay, so in terms of attracting other people, to mm -hmm. come in your direction as a kind of with your new startup again attention to detail mm -hmm. why don't you share you know is is do you have like if you had the opportunity to say right anybody who is in this area or is finding these difficulties please give me a call so here's your opportunity to share it <laughs> okay thank you uh yeah so who I find is helped the most are people in typically in office settings. And it's, it's anyone from reception to data entry to sales and, and engineering, finance, accounting. So, you know, really office settings where there's a lot of analysis going on and just a lot of room for error. We all deal with those distractions. We, we all have trouble sort of maintaining interest in what we're doing and uh, maybe understanding what amount of knowledge we need for a specific task. And the, the workshops and the online training help people have a framework for understanding what the, what the core of their specific issue is. And by understanding that, they can then label and identify what it is and and apply some methodology for what they need to do to correct it. It's not, it's not overly complicated. Some of it seems intuitive. I mean, it, a lot of it is very intuitive. Uh, but the, the feedback is real. It's really benefiting people. Mm. It's providing mm. a lot of, a lot of uh, people who are in challenging situations with a solution they can really use and apply every day. So, you know, whether it's, whether it's the online course or, the workshop for an organization, um, you know, it's something everyone should be, be willing to check out. And of course, I'm always happy to take a phone call. The book is actually written um, and will be available on Amazon as oh, soon wow. as I can make time to do it. It's done. It's sitting there. I just have to, right. you know, have the have the the book is being designed or the cover is being designed. So that will be available shortly. Um, but anyone is 
is welcome to reach out to me uh, on the website uh, attention to detail dot com and and reach out and see if there's you know a solution if there's something someone's looking for I'm happy to to chat and see if we need to make a custom solution um, but yeah I, I certainly encourage everyone to check it out and you know what I, I want to add one thing because you mentioned you mentioned Steve Jobs and I I had this question not long ago, and he's the first person that came to mind, and so I kind of put the two together. Mm. People say, well, okay, details absolutely are important, but what about this big picture thing? You know, we don't want to get so bogged down into details Mm. that we miss the big picture. We miss kind of what's going on. And I, I really do get this question every now and then, but people frame it as if it's a this or that, you know, as if it's are you detail oriented or are you big picture? And it's not like that. Mm-hmm. And Steve Jobs, the perfect example, he was amazingly big picture oriented, right? I mean, his, his vision literally changed the world forever. That's right. But he was super detail oriented. I mean, there are, there are legendary stories of him uh, where he, you know, would not let a product go into production because something no one would have ever thought of wasn't perfect about it. Um, so maybe he's an extreme example, right? I mean, he's certainly an outlier, but that's the deal. If you talk to just about any successful person, they understand the big picture, and they also understand that the details are super important. Maybe they don't take care of the details themselves. Maybe they have someone else do it, but they know they're there, and they know how important mm-hmm. they are. And so I just, you know, I, I want... Thank you. I like people understand that we're yeah. not just about getting bogged down in the little details. Mm. It's a uh, it's really a holistic view and understanding the importance of the details well, and for the delivery of, of any product or service uh, for, for everyday excellence. That's, and, that's what we're I, really going for. I think it's quite interesting because you could almost say that lead optimize is the big picture stuff and the intention to detail is the detail <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you could. Yep, yep. <laughs> Good. <laughs> because that's what you're doing, yeah. right? <laughs> so, and you know, the, yep. the most fascinating thing, the, the story that I have blogged about in the past about the attention to detail thing, I don't know if you remember, and I know we all use Apple as a kind of story that we share, but there's one particular one that I like because I was affected by it. I think it was when the iPhone 4 came out. Four, no, five. Five came out. You ha- we had something called a tenor gate, uh, which is when people put their hand over the phone, they, their reception got down, went down. And huh. um, first of all, he came out and said, oh, we don't have a problem. And then he went, well, have a free bumper for your phone and that will solve it. But there was one thing he did, which was just incredible. He showed the inside of their testing chamber where they test phones for it was like a sound chamber. It was the weirdest thing you'd ever seen. And it was the first yeah. time we all got an insight as to how they tested the phone. And I've never forgotten it because it was such a radical thing to do to show people this is how we test the phone for making sure it has the best possible reception you could ever achieve, you know. Wow. Um, and um, and he showed a video clip of it and they showed how they tested it and everything. And that was an incredible move. And it absolutely makes your point, which is his attention to detail or their attention to detail in terms of testing. Mm. And the, one, the other second story is the inside of their equipment is equally gorgeous to the outside <laughs> of their equipment you know who wants to make the inside look beautiful that no one ever sees um, right. and that's true attention to detail for me yep. and then the last Absolutely. thing because i know you've got to go because you're moving office but l- the last thing to share with everybody and you as well and that is nowadays my wife is particularly good at this she will spot <laughs> mistakes in in marketing letters event yeah. pages the tiniest detail that people share in their communication it is so bad these days almost every bit of content i receive now and i don't go looking for it but it just stands out at you there's something missing you know 
people promote an event yeah. or a workshop and they forget to put the address on it or they forget to put the, <laughs> the date on it or the location or something they forget to do. They put a post on Facebook, they tell, they share all this wonderful stuff that they're going to do, but there are, there are no links to it, you know. Right. And really, it's quite bad, Chris. Really, it's really terrible. And you kind of go, is it because people just don't know how to use technology? No, it's because they are, haven't got that attention to detail. Yeah, I agree completely. It uh, and that that costs someone something in terms of money if it has to be reprinted, mm. or embarrassment, or cost because someone didn't show up because they didn't know when to show up. Yeah, uh, you know the implications are are kind of all over the place. That's um, right. And it doesn't take that much to to not make those mistakes. You know, it it, it uh, uh, just a little more attention in the right in the right places can can make all the difference. Brilliant. Chris, thank you so much for your time. Um, you thank already you. mentioned attentiontodetail.com to, to find out more. Anywhere else people can get hold of you? LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, so LinkedIn, uh, just look me up, Chris Denny, and there is a, a, an Attention to Detail page. You can just search it. And then uh, on Facebook, I'm there as uh, Attention to Detail. Right. So, uh, But the website is really the best place to the best place to start. Okay. So that's where, you know, people can find videos and information and, and of course, links to everything else. I really look forward to, to um, witnessing your, your ongoing journey and how it all works out. Do keep us posted and do send me a link to the book. And even though, you know, the interview will have been published, I will go back and just add the link to the book as well. So if people want to go and get the book, download it or buy a hard copy or whatever, then they can do that as well because that will be a, a great resource for people to get started with as well. So, Chris, thank you so much for, for coming on the podcast today. I, I love your story. I love your new project. I think it's going to be very helpful for a lot of people in the world um, to get more attention to detail in what they're doing. And I hope all my communication about the podcast was uh, had enough attention to detail there as well. And um, <laughs> I, I, I look forward to, to seeing what you're up to and how it's all going. So do keep in touch. I will. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, actually, all the materials you sent were, were wonderful and, and made this very easy. I really appreciate it. Thanks brilliant, so much. Brilliant. Take care, Chris. All the best. You, you too. Cheers. Bye for now. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 